Good evening. This is just a, a wonderful turnout, and I think this is going to be a wonderful event, and so I'm glad that you have all come. I'm Kitty Lewis. I'm general manager of Brick Books, and as part of our 40th anniversary of Brick Books celebration, one of our projects this year was our classics series. And so if you've looked over on the book table, you can see that there are six different titles. Uh, all designed by Robert Bringhurst, so beautifully, beautifully designed, and with bricks that were found on his property. So, and they're all different bricks, brick, different brick on the front. Anyway, the, uh, the six, these were our, mo our most popular titles, and we thought we would give them a new life. So the titles are Short Talks by Ann Carson, The Grey Islands by John Steffler, Riffs by Dennis Lee, A Really Good Brown Girl by Marilyn Dumont, Hard Light by Michael Crummy, and the book that we're celebrating tonight, Wittgenstein Elegies by Jan Zwicky. I am going to introduce our performers this evening in alphabetical order. Robert Bringhurst is the author of a lot of books of poems, several books of translations from Haida and Classical Greek, and a book about typography called The Elements of Typographic Style. Robert says typography is visual linguistics, and poetry is applied linguistics, and translation is applied poetry. So these are all one thing. He is married to Jan Zwicky, which, he says, is applied poetry too. <laughs> <laughs> he's here tonight to read the voice Jan has called stillness, but he's here also because we wish to honor him as the designer of the entire Brick Books Classic series. Our next author is Tim Lilburn. Tim will be known to many of you as one of Canada's most respected poets, essayists, and teachers. Since 1986, he has published more than a dozen collections of poetry and essays, and has convened several notable symposia on poetry and the environment. Like the Viennese poet Georg Trachel, whose part he will be taking this evening, his work is profoundly original, ecstatic, and alive to the natural world. Although Wittgenstein isn't exactly his main man, Tim also has a powerful interest in philosophy. Originally from the prairies, he has been teaching at the University of Victoria since 2004. And Helen Marsoff. Helen is the visual artist on the bill this evening. She is presently director of this wonderful artist-run center, Open Space, which has been Victoria's home for contemporary visual art, new music, media arts, literary readings, and other inter interdisciplinary projects for 43 years. Born and raised in Saskatchewan, Helen came to Victoria after serving as the director curator of the Dunlop Art Gallery in Regina for a decade. She will be reading the part of Wittgenstein's early work, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which has been described as a vision of an inexpressible crystalline world of logical relationships. And we have pianist Bruce Boat who was born in Cornwall, Ontario, where I also grew up. And Bruce's parents and my parents were very good friends. <laughs> we had never met until tonight. <laughs> but for the past 34 years, he has lived here in Victoria, where he has been professor of piano at UVic. His repertoire encompasses music from the 16th century to the present, including premieres of a number of new works. And he performs nationally and internationally on a regular basis. It is his, his special affinity for the music of Franz Schubert that connects him to Vienna, and so ultimately to one of Schubert's great admirers, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Tonight he will be reading the part of Wittgenstein's late work, Philosophical Investigations. And then we come alphabetically to Jan Zwicky. Jan is our author tonight. Wittgenstein Elegies was her second book of poetry, first published in 1986. Since then, she has published many more books of poetry and philosophy. The idea binding them together is what she calls lyric thought, thinking that seeks a deeply integrated understanding of the world. She is also a musician, which is how she knows Bruce. And she's originally from the prairies, which is how she roped her friends Helen and Tim into this. <laughs> Robert got stuck with it because she's stuck to him. <laughs> She'll be taking the role of Wittgenstein's interior voice, which is based on his notebooks and on memoirs by his friends and family. And I will now turn this over to Jan. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kitty, for convening this, um, for convincing me to republish this. Our thanks also to the Canada Council and the other granting agencies that have made the Brick Classic series possible and this reading tonight possible. I wanted to say a few words about the poem and to go over again who's reading what. It's uh, an unusual endeavor. <laughs> Ludwig Wittgenstein, a philosopher, and a poem, a, uh, a series of five linked poems about his work. Mm, why? Bertrand Russell, in his autobiography, recounts the following story about Ludwig Wittgenstein, the philosopher. He used to come to see me every evening at midnight and pace up and down the room like a wild beast for three hours in agitated silence. Once I said to him, are you thinking about logic or your sins? Both, he replied, and continued his pacing. One way to see Wittgenstein elegies, this poem, is as an attempt to take seriously and to understand that both. What links logic and Wittgenstein's sin, sins is a preoccupation with clarity and the conviction that clarity of thought and perception is impossible without clarity of soul. Elegies is a poem in five parts as well as five voices. We'll be announcing the titles of those parts as we proceed. Stillness, the voice that will be read by Robert, is the conscience of the poem. Like the chorus in a Greek play, it provides narrative continuity and also uh, reflections on the conceptual action. It sometimes gets the first and it almost always gets the last word. Georg Trockel, read by Tim, was a Viennese expressionist poet and a contemporary of Wittgenstein. After Wittgenstein decided to divest himself of his family fortune, he requested that the editor Ludwig Ficker um, disperse the funds that Wittgenstein had given, not his whole fortune, but a big chunk of them, uh, among deserving young artists. And both Trockel and Rilke were beneficiaries. Early in the First World War, Trockel, who was a nervous wreck to begin with, uh, was given uh, command uh, of a group of wounded soldiers, 90 of them, but he wasn't given any medical supplies to help them. Then the group's leader committed suicide, and shortly after, Trockel discovered the hanged bodies of several men that had been executed by the Austrians. He collapsed. He wrote to Wittgenstein, apparently having discovered the identity of his benefactor from the psychiatric ward of a Krakow hospital. Wittgenstein, who was also at the front at the time, was unable, unable to get leave immediately, and Trockel died, possibly by his own hand, three days before Wittgenstein got there. During his lifetime, Wittgenstein prepared only two works for publication and published only one of them. The one he published is the so-called Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, and he also prepared for publication the first three quarters of Philosophical Investigations. He filled several running feet of library shelves with notebooks, however, and these were published after his death. The Tractatus, which is a separate voice tonight um, and will be read by Helen, has been described, as uh, Kitty said, as a vision of a world of inexpressible crystalline logical relationships. The Tractatus argues that all things of value are ineffable and its aim is to expose the workings of language so that we'll see that this has to be the case, that there, there are these valuable things it can't describe. Wittgenstein later repudiated the so-called picture theory of the Tractatus and its corollary, the idea that meaningful language consists exclusively of propositions. But the essentially mystical character of his thought, in particular, the view that the source of value is ineffable, carried through into the late work the voice of this late work will be read by Bruce. There remains the voice that I'm going to read, the interior voice of Ludwig Wittgenstein. What you'll hear from Helen and Bruce consists almost entirely of direct quotations from the standard English translations of the Tractatus and the Investigations. The interior voice that I will be reading is built in part from those sources, but it also draws uh, heavily on his notebooks. I'm scratching my head with what else you might need to know. Wittgenstein had several siblings, a number of whom committed suicide. 
And among the ones who didn't was a sister, Margaret, for whom he built a house in the same street in which he had earlier studied for his teacher's certificate. His work as an architect and engineer, as you'll hear, profoundly influenced his later views on how language works. When, in one of his bouts of philosophical apostasy, he went off to a hamlet to teach elementary school, Margaret accused him of using a jeweler's knife to open orange crates. His reconsideration of the Tractatus's mechanics was precipitated by a gesture made by the Italian economist Piero Serafa. They were on a journey, and Serafa went and said, what's the propositional form of that? Um, Wittgenstein didn't have an answer. <laughs> the fourth poem is constructed as a dialogue between the Tractatus and the investigations, and I hope that uh, you will hear surprising echoes as well as points of opposition. The poem, Confessions, takes its name from Wittgenstein's favorite book of philosophy, St. Augustine's Confessions. The final poem takes place in a fishing village in Ireland to which Wittgenstein retreated in 1948 hoping he'd be able to complete the manuscript of investigations, but he died three years later with the final sections unrevised. Oh yeah, and when he was up in the mountains teaching the school kids, he wrote a spelling book for them. <laughs> Philosopher's Stone. Immense turn in the deep black, small points of light, faint gleam or slash along some buried axis, white reticulated wink, sighs only guessed at but staggering, swing of infinite compounded rhythms through the unthought reach, each note pure, perfectly distinct the graveness of a star. Whom did this grow within? Slow, ramified, unfolding, sky of a summer night that hung the crystal arch above us, hummed silence. But who is it that heard? Who could have thought that it might go like this about the rolling piecemeal world. It is the possibility of life as art. Analysis was never meant to hold or judge. A purifier of the ore it cannot comprehend. Don't rest your weight on earth. For this, suspend yourself from heaven. Then, there will be light enough to leave untouched the truth of each thing as it is. We will be different. The speech of plants is slow and still. We are swum to over distances of light like dreams, a patient with all things, it is the same. Each object shimmers with its fundamental anchor, plumb in chaos. But we are proud. Our deafness wounds the world, braggart boots on meadow grass. Find some way to prove, explain, convince, some way to make the common center plain, epiphanies that soar transparent, frictionless, as glass. Grace is unmoved. It is the light that melts, the spring where words and world fill up with meaning. We will see things stark and dead if we see only things themselves and not the pattern that informs them. What must be understood, not collectivity, not substance, is the depth of an embrace. Resist the great temptation. What rests within, without, floats freely. By any words, 
the truth is unsupportable. To see is to be unafraid to cast away the ladder we have cherished. Webern's paradox, spare solitary elements, yet each wound in the web that's torn apart, then stitched, then fused, the gleaming cicatrix become the very twisting of the thread. Can one encounter fix the axis of a life? A single glance, the brush of hands, an indrawn breath, all specificities pre-shadow loss, hold at their center absence, empty echo of the ardent voice. When I have won through to the end, done with the world, I shall have made it simple, clear, the infinite variety of circumstance set to one side so that in this, my world, there will exist no tragedy. Words show us everything. How? Sense is vertical, position in the counterpoint, a necessary unity, aesthetics, ethics, truth, whole presences in every word, the flicker of an eye. Love is, despite the rock that is the world. It spills a tumbling, careless wealth across the granite face. The act of will unspeakable. The world's own grief that grasps the sweet ebullience rests it molecule by molecule to build the crystal's heart. Painstaking day by day locks in the secret, vast, brilliant passion of the moveless, glinting sea. The Death of Georg Trockel. Head down, imponderable coffee cold, the far reach of lead-skied November afternoons, his seriousness a lump, a great huge lump. He staggers underneath it like a saint. What has he seen? Or do those eyes see only through? He never speaks. A sign, perhaps, a sign, the vacancy of imbeciles, the simply mad or talented is not so vibrant, darkly luminous. A stupid dream, all emptiness. What we have seen is what the world acquires from the strangeness of the way we see, have seen, what we have heard. Mere echoes of ourselves, of others. Beautiful is the stillness of the night. On a dark plain we gather with shepherds and white stars. When autumn has come, a sober clarity appears in the grove. Calmed, we wander beside red walls, and our round eyes follow the flight of birds. Sometimes, he speaks, echoes. He speaks, echoes. So pure, almost unrecognizable. And it's what one must wish. No clutter, stripped bare, colors pure, original, unsayable itself, directly echoed. I have scraped and cut, but unforgivable, the clumsiness. These limbless sentences show nothing, little heaps of rags and dust. Purity of heart eludes me. Absence, clear, still space where truth might echo, chokes these thick, haphazard days. My soul is made of sand, slides down itself, 
collapses under every press of structure, even, shapeless, yellow, same. I cannot help these words as he can, mute radiance, the empty, shining valley. I cannot keep them clean, they suffocate, fall stillborn from my mouth, prod them for signs of life like poisoned mice. It is like this, we are asleep. Our life is like a dream. Only in better hours do we wake enough to realize we dream. I cannot shake myself to consciousness. At most, I can endure, which is not courage, but the dumb strength of the body. What is most simple has no way of being said, can only show itself a pure outstretch of arm. My words are useless as my hands. Dream bodies move, but real ones do not stir. Wealth clutters, opulence breeds death. Enough to stay clean, sanity is nothing more. I'll work, give all the rest of it to art. The bright-souled starve, but do not say from whom to whom. Namelessness is blessedness. What's hidden does not interest us. A philanthropic fluke, you think, a whim. Why use a jeweler's knife to open orange crates? Because you gop behind sealed windows, cannot know what storm is raging, how a passerby might have to struggle just to stand. The truth is hidden, though it is before you, simplicity once seen that is most striking. Pull the shutters. Leave me stumble past your doorstep, dumb as stone. Objects are simple. They are named by simple signs. They are only named. Signs are their representatives. We can only speak about them, cannot put them into words. In language, we can state only the how of things, not what they are. What signs fail to express, their application shows. In logic, there is nothing accidental. Somewhere, the questions must be simple, essence etched in every word. There must be a realm in which the answers a priori form a system, simplex sigillum wary. What signs fail to express, their application shows. If only we are strong enough. The difficulty is a difficulty of the will, not the intelligence. What is seen in essence cannot be immediately open to our view, but something hidden, essence hidden from us, unrecoverable by artifice. Strict cleavages, the lovely logic, winter morning, sunlit, unrecoverable, buried in the background, medium of understanding hidden. Nothing can be explained or deduced. It is all before us. All that happens, all that is the case, is accidental. Hardness of a logical must. Mighty are you, dark mouth within me, shaped from autumn clouds, gold evening silence. A greenly half-lit mountain stream in broken pines, that shadow place, a village which dies piously in sepia. 
Black horses leap there in the misty meadow. You soldiers from the hill where the sun rolls, dying, plunges the laughing blood under oaks speechless. Oh, thunderous melancholy of the army, a gleaming helmet rattled down from the purple brow. So cool the autumn night comes, shining with stars. Above the broken bones of men, the silent, solitary one. Strung up like crows, he saw them. Clear as night against the clear dawn, black stretch, sharp as a caw against the sweet light spread like a breath across a winter window. Love of the weak ones, ninety on his hands, blood of the helpless, by his own hand, stone agony. He saw them, frozen echoes, catch of breath, hung, still, there, his. Turn, world against the great clear space, against their innocence, his guilt. At last, unhidden eyes see through. Turn, world, away through emptiness to some blank place, smudged, filled with sand. Crumble these shadows, indecipher them. Make dust. But answers only clarity and light, mute radiance of the shining valley. Fill him now with pendant echoes, pure impress of truth. His mouth turn, empty echo. Offer, burn the stone, his eyes, split silent light, black orioles, break, world, apart. Smooth sheets. Cool golden afternoon above the oak furred ridge. What failure does this signify, arrival three days late? Cold forehead, temples, thin masked mirrors, blue bruise of fingertips. The silence, wild, white silence. A fence before the gate of heaven, path of the extinguished angel. So too, at death, the world does not alter, but comes to an end. When the answer cannot be put into words, neither can the question be put into words. There are, indeed, things that cannot be put into words. They make themselves manifest. We will never know whether it is a strength or a weakness to have survived where others could not. Only what is simple is hidden, the leaf in spring, this gesture, the mind of God. In the elder days of art, wrought even deeper than one thinks, Gone mushy to the core, no vision 
Only words, 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 words. Mere sketches, columns, lists, a spelling book, a bunch of jigsaw puzzle pieces cut by hand, all knobs or none. But the structure was there. Surely it was there. Laid down, the matrix grasped, scraped clean, fog burnt away. Mirage, a fine and adult dream. No child has handled form so violent, so exquisitely seductive, rough, Innocence alone is in their fingers. What they grasp, unpurified, cracks on the adamantine face of logic like a falling star. Gritty railroad din, the click, the rock and shuffle, silhouette against the sooty window, back of his fingertips, brushing his chin, Italian disrespect, the open palm. Show me the general form of proposition here, root common structure. Answerless. How is it possible to mean? I grope through the rubble, mapless, brittle scraps of thought whirl, eddy in the sharp dry light like grains of sand. The fleshless dead expose the lie. Burnt eyes, burnt lips are motionless. Left lost, we bang like idiots against the bars of reason, while beyond our reach they curl. Blank rictus stopped with earth. They leave inside us rooms that have no keys. Past in the Kuntmanngasse. Handwork, physical geometries. Did this not serve? Slabs, pillars, blocks, and beams. There, too, the unscarred minds of children whispered in the sunlight. What was learnt? The trees grew dappled in the afternoon high overhead, and hours blew at sunset when I was a child. The sky was song. Our muscles leapt. Strength was the easy, supple bend of hope in gardens cool at night beneath an arch of stars. How does one build a living face? The woven lamine of flesh and skin that quicken in a smile. Lines have a history not copied from a photograph. With age one turns, folds over on oneself. Dark valleys deepen in our sleep. Small hands will trace the crumbled courses wonderingly, their fingers white and smooth. Our language is an ancient city, maze of interlocking streets and squares. To know it, we must walk it, crawl through sewers, feel our way by night along the walls. Most answers squat before us, humble questions. Where they tower, not the single-minded cleavage of broad-avenued Baroque, but subtler mysteries reach heavenward, anonymous, the master builders. Think of tools, a hammer, pliers, glue pot, glue, screwdrivers, saw, Nails rule, so might we see the purposes of words. Their uniform appearance, though misleads us, tempts us into superficial thought, sees form in stasis rather than in life. We order lives as houses, drift along the cool black floors unshod, 
a slender height of windows. None can speak the truth who have not mastered their own souls. Our words are a refinement of our deeds. At root, the act, the open hand, like music, pulls us to us, grips us in a shadow of the world's embrace. The green symmetry of plants is accidental, means, not end. And so our lives have system, not in structure, but in function. We are weavers, always weavers of the cloth. We draw the pattern after us, wind, wrap it in our simplest, most convolute of gestures. Work in philosophy is work upon oneself. Slow chip and erasure, fabric first grows rough, then thin, the texture of a life. Rarely under gentleness unless another's other hands to bear the weight, more seldom point the way. So solitary work turns ritual, like ritual rots unless one clings to inner sense, digs one's nails into the darkened core, demands of every gesture that it be as honest as an honest kiss. Bright ligaments grow into bone, just as thought's fibrous tendons interpenetrate the surer stuff of insight, wrap it round, and finally make its shape their own. But where the bone grows warped, and sinews twine about the watery image of desire, that we do mean. One overwhelming fact shall tear the axis of the universe from stasis, wrench it live and open-mouthed about the fixed point of our need. Confessions. The problem is, in what sense can we say that logic is sublime? Thought is surrounded by a halo. Logic at its core is prior to experience, must be common both to world and thought. The hardest thing there is. We want to say there can't be any vagueness. The idea now absorbs us that the ideal is concrete. One vast analysis, a single form at each expression's root. We do not yet see how it can occur, but so superlative a fact. We are seduced. We think it must be in reality. We think already that we see it there, a thing that we had always known but never spoken. This was our mistake. There is a general form of proposition. This is how things stand. A simple structure made of names and possibilities for truth. What is the essence? What makes these sounds a language or its parts? The general form of propositions? No. Nothing is common. All that we call language the phenomena in question are related one to others differently. Because of these relationships, we call them language. It is like a family. Propositions are truth functions of assertions of prime facts. Assertions of prime facts are simple thoughts. What dawned on me Logic is normative. Living speech is not a calculus. 
the most that can be said is we construct ideal languages. Do away with explanation then. Our task is to describe. We have only to accept our words, our practices, and note of false accounts that they are false. Where our spade is turned, there we must rest. Acceptance at the root, ourselves. A thought is a proposition with sense. Certainty is of different kinds, tones, colorings of thought. You're all at sea, we say, when someone doubts a thing we recognize as clearly genuine, and yet we can prove nothing. Can one learn this knowledge? Yes, some can, but not by taking courses. It has rules that form no system. Life alone learns to apply them right. Most difficult here capturing indefiniteness correctly and unfalsified in words. Imponderable evidence includes all subtleties of gesture, glance, and tone. Gesture itself, foundation. Perhaps if I could paint, I might then show the genuine and simulated glance in pictures. Abstractions yield at best what will appear to be the fragments of a system. Although there is something arbitrary in our notations, this much is not. That when we've determined one thing arbitrarily, some other thing is necessarily the case. Essence is shown in general form. What we do in language always rests on something that we take for granted, river in its bed. Essence is grammatical. As though by means of thoughts we catch reality in nets. A thought is a picture, a logical picture of the facts. Do I understand? Of course I understand. I can imagine when you say it. A picture does the service of the words, and the service is the point. But the picture does not point to its own use. So we are taken in. It takes us in. And what is to be done? or how this picture may be used is still obscure. If a sign is useless, it is meaningless. That's Occam's point. And if all things behave as though a sign had meaning, then it does. How do sentences manage to represent? Don't you know? You surely see it when you use them Nothing is concealed. How do they do it? Don't you know? Nothing is hidden. What has got to be accepted, what is given, is a form of life. Our words are deeds. Have you not shut your eyes in the face of doubt? They are shut. Only in the nexus of a proposition does a name have meaning. It comes to this, only of a living human being, and what resembles it can it be said. It sees, is blind, it hears, is deaf. A smiling mouth smiles only in a human face. Hence our attachments to our words. We manifest these feelings by the way we choose and value them. The arrow points only in the application that a living being makes of it. Yes, to mean a thing is to go up to it. What is the case, a fact, is the existence of objects in combination. 
Does each word carry with it a corona of lightly indicated uses, delicate and shadowy hints of scenes? If it is like this, if uses float in half shades, as we say, or hear some word, this simply goes for us. We communicate with others without knowing if it is the same for them. Pictures bewitch. A word's real use compared with that suggested by the picture will seem muddied. We have yearned for speech designed for gods, a highway to the truth. In front of us it shimmers, but of course we cannot use it. It is permanently closed. The possibility of each single case discloses something of the essence of the world. We walk into a room. Our feet are bare. Books, papers, letters piled about, discarded tie and random pencils, pictures crooked on the wall. At first we think, a mess, what disarray, it should be straightened up. But then we look around and recognize that no, no thing can be disturbed. Even the dust is in its place. There is a general form of proposition. This is how things stand. One thinks that one has traced the nature of a thing when really one has traced the frame through which one sees it. And when one draws a boundary, there could be many reasons. The world is all that is the case. The silent path, the dappled shore, blue, blue the water, mist about the mountains. How is it born of peace, this tense world swelling like an ache? Poised as the mist begins to lift. Poised as the mist begins to lift. A reach. This is the very answer. Rossro, County Galway. Grooves in the rough planed planks. Trace the grain back and forth, slow path, back and forth. Salt light from over the dark chafed sea. So much is constant, desk, cot, window, wood, light, sea. Trace, retrace, tide-worn wash of mind. There is nothing left to strip away, grind down, wear off, but still not pure enough, no clarity. Words stumble, clutter, clog. I remain a draftsman. Thought, dull pencil used, to trace the outlines that fragment and blur at every stroke. The naked life is made of two, the naked mind, the naked heart. If only thought as well as art could force the final gesture, that irrevocable moment of ascent when fragment haloed, coalesce, and the great space opens in the world to make us simple. 
Signs by themselves are dead. What gives them life? Who teaches them to dance? In use, they come alive. But where there is no courage, there can be no use, no speaking truth. Our mouths must move like fishes, blank gapes, unfavored by the breath of God. It is evening when one hears most clearly. Losses drop like pebbles in a shallow well. A steady hand in the long shadowed light limbs even the most delicate of ripples, leaves each thing as it is. Yet still the sickness, clumsy need to wrestle with the pattern, make one blueprint to explain all bricks. But wholeness is a gift of art, its essence transcendental. The most that we can hope is steadiness of soul, courage, to render with exactness what is set before us. Love what must each time we grasp it vanish. Grooves in the rough planed planks, over and over, voices, layered voices, brilliant, chafing, lapping one another, echo in the salt light. Great twisted rope, the vision we will ride in flight, above the twilight world. How can we learn to hear each one distinctly, fragile threads in the enormous chorus? And all that we have valued, still high harmony, spare as the memory of November oaks, under an ancient sky. Perhaps what is inexpressible is this. The huge faint height beyond the shadowed heart against which we must measure our lives, the possibility of truth against which only death might mean the emptied voice at last begin to speak. Books wishes to thank Kirk McNally of the University of Victoria for his very generous pre- and post-production assistance with this recording. Thanks also to Benjamin Wilms and Alex Klassen, who recorded the event at Open Space Artists Centre in Victoria, B.C. on November 17, 2015.